Hey guys, today's video is, uh, I don't really know how to explain it, um, Chuck E. Cheese mixed with, um, murder. Yeah, <laughs> don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you at the end of the video. TG, at the request of one of my players, I am sharing with you the most horrible thing they've, no, we've, ever made. It was in a game of Engine Heart. A lovable, light-hearted game about robots after humanity. The party consisted of two repair robots. A butcher robot that harvests anything on four legs. A toy symbol clapping monkey. And the best robot? An animatronic, banjo-playing, hillbilly bear named Barry Banjo that hates children <laughs> because he believes they abandoned him. The party started in an amusement park with a recently crashed ferris wheel bringing them together. Banjo Bear found himself where he would naturally be. Inside, Hill Bunny Billy's Countryside Review, playing his somewhat grating, hour-long show when the wheel came down. The band was already in despair when the Countryside Review exploded under the weight of the collapsing wheel. But fortunately, it occurred during Barry Banjo's Banjo Bear solo, and he was front and centre stage away from the rest of the band. After the dust cleared, the only surviving member of the band was the head hill bunny Billy himself. The banjo bear reached down, scooped up the head, and swore an oath by his banjo that he would rebuild his fallen friend. So began the party's quest, to find salvageable parts to rebuild hill bunny Billy, and by proxy, Find out what happened to humanity, because humans would probably know where salvageable parts were. And that's, more or less, where the first session ended. Oh, but that's not the weird, terrible stuff. That's just the preamble. So as the session was winding down, one of the players posed the question as to what kind of theme park it was they were exiting from. We all decided it was a Disneyland of Appalachia sort of park, with Hill Bunny Billy as its Mickey Mouse. We fleshed it out as a Hanna Barbaria style cartoon. Never as popular as things like Disney, incredibly dated, but still with a strong camp following. We came up with the characters of Hill Bunny Billy and Banjo Bear, of course, followed by Hugsy the Snake, Shelly the Turtle, and a possum, I believe. The theme park, of course, was decided to already be in decline when the humanity destroying disaster struck. In retrospect, I can't say for certain the next idea was mine, but I'll bear the shame of it. As we sat back and milled over the events a little bit, we thought, and someone, probably me, uttered a fateful phrase. You know, it was probably an incredibly alarming racist cartoon. And then the whole thing went to hell. The ideas flowed like water after that. The cartoon was racist in that endearing, unaware of political correctness way that things like the Disney Crows and the Song of the South were. And with that in mind, we drafted up the two main antagonists for the assembled cast, Jiminy Crow and Rascally Coon. They were, it was decided, moving into the cartoon's Appalachia and causing a ruckus. Jiminy Crow and his family keeping up poor Barry Banjo all night with their coin, consuming all of Shelley the Turtle's prized watermelon patch. Rascally Coon, for his part, would sneak into the houses at night and steal things in an effort to make the trash heap he lived on look livable. A deluge off a bit. Side villains came after that. Dotty the Indian Elephant, Chupacabra the Chihuahua, who would hop the fence outside Hill Bunny Billy's house and terrorise the locals with his incomprehensible speech. And the yellow terror, Chinky Stink. The simple clapping monkey in the party was retconned to be from the show as well. A well-meaning, bumbling butler that talked in a bonics and just wanted to be as fine and proper as the rest of the Hill Bunny Billy cast. Shelley became the vehicle for female jokes in the show. She would bring up silly, adorable ideas that the rest of the cast would laugh off good-naturedly. She even had a kitchen inside her shell, so she was never technically out of the kitchen. In fact, the kitchen the butcher robot worked in the back room off was Shelley's kitchen, and he had a small Shelley sticker on the front of his chassis. We all knew it was bad. Shit. We knew it was horrible. We could watch ourselves slowly sliding down towards hell, but we couldn't stop it. 
It all made too much sense. It all fit, as our saving grace. We eventually decided that the racism is mostly covered up in modern days, not entirely gone, due to the creator, who looked like a cross between Walt Disney and Dick Cheney with an eye patch for the eye he lost in the war. <laughs> okay. Still being very much alive up until the disaster and in partial control of his studio. And, probably, a quasi-secret Nazi sympathiser in the vein of, of course, Walt Disney. But I still had, well, have a problem. Now the players of Barney Banjo and the Symbol Monkey are convinced that, in addition to the former's hatred of children, they both have a deep, ingrained, hardwired yet subtle dislike of the lesser races. My party now has a racist, animatronic, Chucky Cheese Robot and Symbol Monkey. What do I do with this, TG? So, second session. The players come across a small, foggy town, imaginatively named Hayes Town. They had found clues in the amusement park via a missive intended for an employee that there had been some people hiding out in the town hall a long time back, and they figured that was the best place to look. As they rolled into town, Barry Banjo picked up his namesake in his bare hands and began to strum a chin. In response to Barry's tinny crooning, a dog barked and whined in the distance. Of course, the butcher robot, deprived of fresh meat after so many years, shot off after the bark like a bolt of lightning. This be the last they'd see of him for half the session. The crew headed towards the town hall, having a rudimentary map. Stopping to help repair an automated house system along the way, Barry propped up Hill Bunny Billy's head, strummed a chin on the porch while they did so, and the symbol monkey found a cleaver in the kitchen and took an immediate shine to it. This will be both important and terrifying later. Oh god. <laughs> they all proceed to the town hall, finding the town covered in a mist and vegetation. The lights were on but dim in the town hall indicating emergency power. As they entered, they heard chatter in high-density binary and found a trio of robots loitering in the ruined lobby. A water cooler robot made for portable liquid dispensation, an eight-armed filing robot, and a large-sized paper shredder slash copier on wheels, looking anxiously and pleading at the in-and-out paper boxes stuffed with papers affixed to the filing robot's chest. Immediately the filing robot accosts the crew, asking the lot of them to register for mandatory service in restoring the town. The party manages to convince the filing robot that they're registered to a private corporation and it slinks off, dejected. They ask it where it can find humans and it mentions that the city hall is being run by the inspector and he's trying to find humans too. They should go talk to him. And, like all great quest hooks, I knew this one was going to end in horrible disaster. As they opened the large courthouse doors at the back of the town hall, a gust blew through, sending a shower of papers into the hall behind them. The room beyond the door was wall to wall, floor to ceiling with books and papers. The party steps slash rolls in, taking a good look around at the filing robots scanning, transcribing and filing the enormous amount of paper in what appears to be piles of library books. The symbol monkey turns around and notices the paper shredder robot stuck at the door. It rolls nervously in, then jerks and shoots itself into reverse for about a foot, then creeps back towards the door, only to shoot backwards again. The monkey, for whatever reason, possessing an acute understanding of digital systems, he claims he was a CIA spy device repackaged as a toy and I'm gradually, begrudgingly accepting this. Realises that the Shredder, affectionately named Shreddy by the party, has been reprogrammed so he can no longer go through the door. The Shredder, for his part, looks very depressed about this fact. So the party finds the robot dubbed the Inspector. A small toy with Sherlock printed on the side and a moulding Burger King crown taped to its head. They talk to Sherlock for a bit, and he keeps answering their more esoteric questions. What are you doing? Where are the people? With, visit your local library, in a fake British accent, 
different from his normal voice. The party figures out that he has been hard-coded to see the library as a solution to all problems, in an effort to promote child literacy. After a few minutes of trying to extract information from the becrowned inspector, Symbol Monkey has had enough of his shit. Symbol Monkey tells Barry Banjo to hold down Sherlock, and Symbol Monkey then attempts to reprogram the struggling inspector. The filing robot sees this, of course, but this conveniently falls under their violence, clearly none of my business, programming perimeters. The flailing, desperate Sherlock eventually gets away unreprogrammed and rouses the alarm, which puts all 60 odd filing robots on, actually, this is my business alert, attempting to swarm poor Barry Banjo and his compatriots. Now, Barry Banjo may just be a poor robotic bear from the backwoods, but he's an American bear from the backwoods. Meaning, of course, that he enjoys a good old-timey game of baseball. Barry picks up the monkey, tosses him as hard as he can at Shreddy, and the monkey lands atop the anxious paper shredder. One successful reprogramming attempt later, Shreddy bursts into the courtroom filled with papers, kicking them into the air and attempting to limbously snatch them out of the air with his tiny shredding mouth bowling over flimsy filing robots left and right. Benny Hill music playing mentally. The party decide this would be an excellent time for an exit and heads back out the way they came to the sound of screeches and binary, loud clangs and a whirring, contented paper shredder. The crew decides to look for clues elsewhere in town and fans out. The maintenance robots, being logical, decide to check the local library. Barry and Simple Monkey, having no ulterior motives whatsoever, decide to check out the local Chuck E. Cheese. The maintenance droids manage, after some melodrama involving the butcher bot showing up once more, chasing a chihuahua, to access the library computer and download some choice bits of info before leaving to regrip at the Chuck E. Cheese. After shoving their way past a pushy customer service robot, They find Barry Banjo and his trusty symbol monkey sitting on a chair, centre stage on the animatronic band stage. Foe tuning his banjo, waiting for the next show to start. The robots hunker down, plug themselves into one of the maintenance robots that acts as a recharger and wait for the morning show. This thread has not only made my day but also my week. Thank you, Opie. (laughs) The show starts at 10am sharp. The curtain rising and Barry attempting to drone out the silly, mostly operable Chuck E. Cheese band with his old-timey country vocals. On the chair next to him sits the head of his best friend, still cold and lifeless, no matter how many times Barry instinctively gestures to him during his show with a hearty, folksy, Take it away, buddy! (laughs) Barry Banjo keeps rolling his human comprehension stat as a sort of proxy for how well he's playing and is feeling objectively. No matter how much he is backed up by the symbol monkey on percussion, the Chuck E. Cheese band is barely beating him in their tinny animatronic glory. And for the second time that session, the symbol monkey just snaps. He readies his looted cleaver, lunges from the banjo bear's shoulders where he was perched and takes off Chuck E. Cheese's head with one deft swing. The sparking body falls, mostly lifeless to the ground, and shit hits the fan. Now, Chuck E. Cheese's band isn't comprised of proper robots, but cheapo animatronic small world dummies that really can't fight back against, say, the welding lasers employed by both the maintenance bots being used to carve holes in the chassis of Chuck E. Cheese's bandmates. The robot monkey continues to hack at the rival band's ankles and the maintenance robots put on the best old laser light show Barry Banjo has ever seen. This is amazing. (laughs) After the dust from the most one-sided fight in post-apocalyptic robo-history settles, Barry declares himself the unchallenged winner of the Battle of the Backwood Bear Bands. Eyeing the wreckage, he asks one of the maintenance droids if they could help him with something. He's just an old clumsy country bear after all, and he needs some help soldering his friend's severed head onto Chuck E. Cheese's decapitated body. 
I roughly explained to the player of the maintenance droid that doing so would be like welding an Intel processor to a Macintosh toaster and expecting them to communicate meaningfully. But she figures she might as well try it anyway. Now, the word abomination gets thrown about in a lot of role playing, but the sight of Hill Bunny Billy's head sitting askew, welded onto Chuck E. Cheese's shoulders, droning a slowed down, partially reversed songs from Billy's repertoire at random due to his damaged internal clock as it staggers half blind around the room following Barry Banjo's pretty much fits it to a tape. Barry was, of course, delighted and thanked the little maintenance droid for their help in bringing his best friend in the whole wide world back to him, mostly. But still, the monkey was unsatisfied. The Chuck E. Cheese was still standing and therefore their victory wasn't absolute. Something would have to be done. The company follows the monkey to the basement. The power was on, the monkey figured, and that meant the place had a generator. And so it did. An always safe, personal nuclear powered generator. The monkey was, naturally, overjoyed. He couldn't ask for more, and practically begs the maintenance droid to rig up the generator to blow. One of them straight up fails knowing anything about nuclear physics. It's an amusement park repair robot, after all. And the others know just enough to make things explode. So the smaller maintenance robot, the same that soldered Hill Bunny's head, got to work. After a few rolls and increasing difficulty, she managed to set the reactor to have a 100% chance to explode, but only a 90% chance of going off in two days, when she wanted it to. Her layman's grasp of amusement park nuclear physics told her that, if done properly, this thing could take out the whole town. I asked the party if I should roll to see if it would go off now. One of the players, the guy who played the other maintenance droid, joked, no, you should probably roll early. <laughs> Sounds fair. I told him with a smile and picked up a D10 and rolled it behind my screen. On a one, I said, it'd go off. Four. Well, so far so good for the first hour. I wouldn't tell them, but they were safe for an hour. I decided to roll for R2. One. Well, shit. Maybe that was a fluke? Let's re-roll that. One. Okay, definitely a fluke. One more re-roll. One. Okay, fuck dice, you win. They die in two hours. I look up at them with a poker face. So, how about that nuclear reactor? Oh shit. The smaller maintenance robot calculated odds and chirped to the other robots that they only have a 10% chance of nuclear death. The other robots convened, bickered, and then eventually to the monkey's vociferous objections, decided that a 10% chance of nuclear death was really high. The small maintenance droid began dutifully working on disarming the bomb she set, and I whipped out my trusty D10 with a death wish for the party. She rolled successfully. Good. That meant there was only a 10% chance the bomb would go off anyway. Closed my eyes, rolled the single D10, cupped my hand and pressed it down in the table. Oh, thank fucking God. No nuclear total party kill on session two. The reactor slowly shut down and the lights dimmed. The robots found their way out of the basement and onto the main level where the monkey was already fast at work rolling and carefully positioning barrels of propane it found in the kitchen. The hill bunny abomination began to drone its backwards, slow, monotone song as they slowly walked away from the Chuck E. Cheese, pausing only long enough for the larger of the two maintenance droids to fire its welding laser at a carefully placed propane tank, starting a chain reaction with the others and the ambient propane gas inside Chuck E. Cheese, igniting the building in an instant torrent of chemical hellfire. And that to my recollection, is where the session two ended. Barry has vowed to get not just Hill Bunny, but the rest of the entire band back together. The maintenance droids have the sneakiest suspicion that something is horribly wrong with the situation, but don't have the comprehension to put a finger on it. And the monkey? He discovered for the first time in his robotic monkey life that he loves setting things on fire. I can't wait for session three. So, like, normally we like to talk about the actual story at the end of the video. 
However, we got something really fucking cool that you guys should, should like, you know, really check out. You know Garbo? You know that guy that does, like, Stranded in Fantasy? Hey, y'all! Yeah, yeah. It's Garbo! <laughs> yeah, yeah, he also voice acts on, well, it's not his channel, Nerdbeardia, but, like, that's neither here nor there. However, he did do a video. I sent him these models fucking ages ago, and he's finally got around to doing a video on it. Now, it's pretty cool. He did a review of the models that I sell. Very honest review. And it was a very honest review, but I did say to him, it's like, like, you know, I know myself, the models are not perfect by any means, but, you know, they do have some issue, but for the most part, I think they're pretty good quality, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm very happy with them. However, like, links down below, check that shit out. I hope you enjoyed this story. I always like stories that have got, like, you know... It was fucking weird. Yeah, it was fucking weird, but I like them whenever they're not set in traditional fantasy setting. Yeah. Does that make any sense? I like, I like something a bit different. Yeah. You know, give me a bit of a different setting than what we're used to. But look, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember, like, comment, subscribe, all the other good shit. Definitely check out Garbo's video. Like, just do it and subscribe to him. And, like, he's very close to getting his channel monetized, so just... Yeah, do it. <laughs> Go on, help him out. Help him out. Oh, sorry, pardon me, I'm barking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut that out, so I'll... Or will I? Anyway, like, as always, guys, hope you guys enjoyed. Remember, like, comment, subscribe. All of the good shit. And we'll... See you in the next video? Yeah, I suppose that's what you normally say, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Right, see you later.